Zach, this is Nick from NBC here in Charlotte. Welcome. Uh, what has it been like your first camp here and, and how is everybody kind of adjusting to each other? You're, you're definitely not the only new face around. Oh man. Um, how you doing, Nick? Uh, it, it, it's been cool, man. I'm, it, it's kind of been, um, you know, try, it, it's been weird trying to figure everything out since, you know, our first time meeting each other face to face was a couple weeks ago. Uh, so it's definitely new. It's definitely different, but I think, you know, as far as now, we, you know, we had a number of practices on our belt. We didn't, you know, we didn't had a couple of scrimmages. So I think everybody's kind of starting to get comfortable with each other. We're starting to kind of figure out who, you know, who's who and who likes what, who doesn't like what. But um, I've been, I've enjoyed it so far. You know, anytime you're away from the game for a little bit and you get a chance to get back at it, you, you know, you, you realize how much you actually do love the game. And um, I think that's what this camp is doing for me. It's been, it's been a little humid than I'm used to, but uh you know, I'm not going. I'm not going to complain about it. <laughs> Zach Ashley Mahoney with the Charlotte Post. Pleasure to meet you. And you touched on the humidity. Have any of the other veteran guys talked to you a bit about Spartanburg and what a traditional camp would be like and how humid that would be? Yeah, they actually did. And believe it or not, I actually lived in Spartanburg when I was young for like a few months. So I'm kind of familiar with that humidity out there. So I much rather this humidity we got in Charlotte, but, um, you know, coming from, coming from Denver, it was just, it's just a little different. You know, we got the high altitude there and, um, it, it's not humid at all, you know, coming here where it's like, you could like slice the humidity in half, you know, when you're outside. So, uh, I, I they definitely told me I'm a little lucky, but, um, you know, it's just, it was still new to me. I'm not gonna lie. Hey Zach, it's Jason Brown with Spectrum News One in Charlotte. Uh, good to see you. Vir at least meet you virtually. Um, obviously this training camp has been way different than any of us have ever experienced before, but I'm wondering if you can maybe draw a comparison as to where the, your team is right now, as far as development's concerned versus maybe where they would be in a normal training camp, or is it pretty much the same? Um, I think as far as uh, development, as far as what? What do you mean by development? Well, obviously, you know, you've been around the league, so you, you, you know there's a certain time of year where teams ramp it up and they're trying to sort of really sort of get honed in on, on their scheme and, and uh -huh. what they're able to do. In other, words, in other words, getting ready for a season, getting ready getting for ready that for first a season. game. Yeah, I mean, honestly, man, I think um, the guys are developing pretty well. I think all of us are. We're, we're understanding the playbook. It's, um, you know, very, very few mental errors, which is always good when you're, when you're in a new scheme. But, you know, the coaches do a great job of coaching us and the coaches do a great job of making sure we understand what our responsibilities are. And it's a it's a, you know, a collective effort amongst everybody. You know, everyone It's not just the players um, that are working on development. The coaches are working on it as well. And, you know, they're new. You know, my first time meeting my coach was, you know, two weeks ago. So everybody's still working on developing, you know, whatever it is they want to develop. But I can't say that we are uh, locking in on the scheme and, you um, we're seeing a lot less mistakes, uh, which is, I think, is a good thing. I think we just got to get everybody to continue working hard and playing hard, and I think we'll be all right. Hey, Zach, uh, this is Miles Simmons from Panthers.com. What uh, attracted you to the Panthers and made you want to sign with them? And, you know, how has, I guess, the, the reality compared to what the expectation was when you did that? Well, for me, man, I mean, coming in undrafted, I've always embraced change and embraced something new. Uh, so... I, it's kind of funny because I, I seen Matt Rule's um, presser when he got the job and I hadn't, you know, gotten any information on where I was going to play next or anything like that. But I, I actually told my friends, I was like, I, I, I like to play for that dude. Like, you know, he seemed like he said the right things, knew what to say, he seemed like he loved football. So I was kind of excited about it. And, um, you know, that was one of the things. And then also just being in a new environment, man, and helping um, something new build if that makes sense you know I, I, I've always enjoyed you know just getting out the mud and and rebuilding something and rebuilding myself and reinventing myself as a person reinventing myself as a player so that was one of the things that really attracted me to it is uh just being able to come in and having an opportunity to create something new you know from uh you know from the ground up so to speak Zach, uh, Jason Huber with WFNZ, hope you're doing well. When, yeah, you say, you know, building from the ground up, you've got, you know, a handful of young guys on that defensive line, Derek Brown being a rookie mm -hmm. defensive tackle. Mm -hmm. What have you seen so far from the D-line being a guy who's been in the league a few years? Um, I think a lot of the guys here, that, that, I mean, Derek, obviously, you know, seventh overall pick for a reason. Um, I've seen a, 
a lot of good things out of him. Uh, just being a rookie, you know, he's he's really, really strong. You know, he's a, he's a lot quicker than what you would expect him to be. But even Bravion, Bravion plays good ball. You know, Miles Adams, he plays good ball. You know, a lot of these young guys play good ball. And I think um, that's a testament to, uh, you know, the front office and the ex and executives. You know, those guys handpick, you know, the guys that they want in the building. I think they did a good job of that. You know, they're not, you know, they're not bashful. These guys love to learn. They ask questions. They're not, you know, they don't think they're too, you know, too good for anything. And they just come in and they work hard and they play football, man. And that's that's kind of what you, you want out of your rookies. Uh, and I think they've all done a good job up to this point. We're all still learning. We're all still trying to get better, but I think up until this point, they, they they've done a really good job of handling the adversity. You know, their first their first season being you know the the pandemic COVID season, so to speak, and um, I think they're handling it really well and doing a really good job of taking care of themselves, taking care of their bodies, and and learning the football and keeping and keeping themselves up to speed. Hey Zach, it's Joe Person with the Athletic. Good to see you. Good to see you, Joe. Um, I guess you guys were scheduled to be off yesterday, uh, previously scheduled out of that, that practice off. Wondering uh, if you've given any converse, if there'd been any conversations among uh, older guys or the whole team, uh, you know, sitting out of practice for social justice reasons. And also wondering if David Tepper had addressed you guys on that topic. I saw him at practice today. Oh uh, yeah. We, we've talked about it. Um, you know, uh, amongst everyone, you know, from young to old, you know, it, with something like this, it doesn't matter how many years you've been in the NFL. Or, you know, it, it's it's a human thing. You know, when you talk about this, it's not really a vet thing or a rookie thing or even an owner, you know, from, you know, Mr. Tepper or head coach to Matt. It, it, it does, it's a human thing when you talk about this. So it, the conversations have been had. And, um, you know, my, you know, my aspect is like, you know, what, what are we going to, what action are we going to take? Like, you know, we can, um, we we can we cannot we cannot practice we can tweet we can protest we can do all these things but we need to take action you know and I feel like those are the conversations that need to be had not about you know whether we're gonna practice or whether we're gonna you know tweet this or whether we're gonna protest like we need to we need to take action and and, and it doesn't start with um, you know guys in the NFL you know or, or guys that are in the entertainment business so to speak um, you know we you know we do our jobs and we do our jobs at an elite level. Um, but I just, you know, for me, I just, I want people to understand that this is a human issue. You know what I'm saying? This isn't a, a sports issue. This isn't an athletic issue. This isn't, this is an issue that humans need to fix, you know? So we've talked about it and that's kind of my take on it. So like, you know, I, I, I kind of get, I get a little frustrated because people look to athletes and they look to entertainers and all these other guys and they try to point us as the guys to, you know, get it done. We have our platform and we use our platform, but you know, the, there are people in place that, that you know, that set these laws and set this systematic oppression that we've been dealing with for, you know, years, hundreds of years. And, you know, my whole thing is just we need to take action on that. You know, it's hard to undo, you know, years of years and years of different systematic oppression, but action needs to start. You got to start somewhere. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of my take on it. And, you know, the conversation that we've had, that's what I tell everybody. Like, OK, we can't if we all decide not to go to practice. OK, what are we going to do now? You know, and that's kind of where I met with it. And, um, you know, it's frustrating being a black man, frustrating having a black son, um, you know, seeing the things that are going on in the world. But like I said, I can't stress it enough. Action needs to be taken on on all parts, you know, not just athletics. We need everybody, you know, all hands on deck with this thing. He's at uh, Jonathan Alexander, Child Observer. Hope you're doing well, man. What's going on, bro? Not much. Um, I'm wondering, you know, First of all, how old is your son, and and what kind of can you kind of explain what kind of conversations you have to have with him? Um, so my son is three; he just turned three 19 days ago, and um, you know he he it, it, for him it's different. Me and him grew up different. You know he he's he's experienced a lot of things at at the age of three that I didn't. I had to wait till I was 24 to experience. You know what I'm saying? So the conversations that I have with him are more so just him realizing who he is. You know. Uh, I, you know, I always tell him, I'm like, look, I did, you know, I started school when I was in, you know, when I was five, you know, he's in pre-K, he, you know, he's bilingual, he's, you know, he's super smart, knows a bunch of things, but I always just have to remind him who he is and and and, and who we are and what the world is going to view you as, you know, um, it doesn't matter, you know, at the end of the day, I can go out to a restaurant and it doesn't matter if I'm Zach Kerr, the defensive lineman for the Carolina Panthers, they're not going to see Zach Kerr, the de defensive line 
defensive lineman for the Carolina Panthers. They're going to see a black man first. And those are the type of things that I try to explain to my son um, when, you know, when, when he's around his friends and when he's acting out in public, it's just like, look, man, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't care who you are. You know, that's not the first thing that they see. The first thing they see is what you look like, you know? And, and that's my biggest thing to him is just knowing who he is, man, making sure he knows his history, making sure he knows what it took for us to get to where we are in the world today and what else is going to take for us to further ourselves past who we are in this world today and you know i think that's the biggest conversation is, is knowing who you are knowing your history man and um and, and passing that down to the next generation because there's no point in knowing and, and doing all these great things if you're not going to pass it down if you just if you're not going to you know share the blessings and be selfish about it so that's my biggest thing hey zach this is elena getzenberg with the charlotte observer Hope How you doing, elena? Um, I was wondering for you, you know, I know you mentioned that everyone needs to take action. This is not an athlete thing. This is not, you know, this shouldn't just be something we're talking to athletes about. But right. is there something specific you would like to see the team do next or just something like action you think that, you know, should come next from the conversations you're having? Yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's just it's 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 it's, it's reforming the laws. It's just it's accountability on all on all, on all levels. You know, you. You know, you see different things. You talk, you know, you got people talking about defunding the police. And it's like, okay, defunding the police. I can understand that. But what about, you know, it takes longer for me to get my barber's license than it takes for me to become a cop. You know, we can talk about stuff like that. Those are the type of things that we need to talk about and we need to address. And I feel like we need to focus more on that than just radically going to point B. You know, like, it's easy to be like, okay, we're, I'm, we're just done with it, you know, but you got to you got to formulate a, a plan and, and really, really dive in and figure out how you can undo. And I can't stress this enough, undo hundreds of years of systematic oppression and systematic laws and different things that, you know, just didn't help people that look like me. You know, so I think that's where you got to start. You got to go to these, you know, officials and these and, and the gov. you know, anyone, you know, Anybody that makes a law or has to sign off on a law, we got to hold them accountable because they are the ones that are responsible for the, for the things that are taking place. And they're the ones that need to be held accountable. And so do police officers, but we got to remember how they got there. You know, kids don't, you know, I'm not even going to use kids. I use dogs. Dogs just don't, you know, as puppies just want to bite people. You know what I'm saying? They learn, that's a learned behavior, you know? So you got to figure out where that learned behavior is coming from you know, to cause these different things. And then you got to go there and tag it and meet it and meet it head on. Becca, this is Miles Simmons again. Um, do you feel like it's a little bit unfair? I mean, you kind of touched on this, but do you feel like it's yeah. unfair that athletes are being asked to do so much and speak on this so much when, as you said, it's the elected officials who, and some who are not elected, who right. are responsible for these issues? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say it's unfair because, to, you know, to who much is given, much is tested. And this is what we ask for. We ask, every time I complain about something, I always remind myself, this is what I told myself I wanted to do. And when you get to this point in your life and you're playing professional sports and you're in the limelight all the time and people know who you are and it comes with the, you know, I used to hate when people say that it comes with the job, but it does. So I don't, I don't think it's unfair. I actually expect, um, you know, people to look to us for the answers because that's what they see. That's not their fault. That's what the media does. The media is pushing, okay, the athletes, the rappers, the act. Like, it's not It's not the society's fault. You know, this is what media chooses to portray. They show all that stuff. They think that that's what everyone wants to see. So when something goes bad, that's who they look to. They look to who they see all the time. You know, so I don't think it's unfair. I think it comes with the job. But at the same time, we do have to realize and we have to remember that we are athletes in our jobs and outside of our jobs, we are humans, you know? So when it comes to social injustice and when it comes to, you know, different things or protesting and stuff like that, what people got to realize is that, you know, like I said before, like when I'm done playing football, I'm still going to be a black man. You know what I'm saying? So it, I don't think that it's unfair that, 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 you know, that they look to us. What I do think is unfair is that, we as athletes are so far removed from a lot of issues that happen that we don't necessarily 
feel like we have to say or do something about it because you know uh example i use all the time is twenty dollars now and twenty dollars seven years ago is different twenty dollars to me you know so police brutality now and police brutality seven years ago two different types of police. i haven't had to deal with police brutality or police periods since i've been in the nfl a lot of these issues i have not had to deal with but i still got family members that go through it i still have sisters i still have you know i still have you know people around me that go through these issues so i don't think it's unfair um but i, I do want people to realize that we are trying and we we do care um just just give us some time because you know we, we got a lot of stuff a lot of stuff on our place that we're trying to figure out behind closed doors. Guys, we probably have time for a couple more for Zach. Also, if we're good, that's fine too. Ryan, I have another one if that's okay. Go ahead, Ashley. Thank you. Zach, you touched on the importance of holding elected officials accountable and government officials as a whole. And the campaign that the team rolled out earlier about the importance of voting, particularly since Bank of America Stadium will be an early voting site. Is that something that you want to get involved in, in terms of just making sure that people are aware and educated? And I know a word that's been used a lot around that is empowered to actually vote in November instead of saying, oh, well, perhaps my vote doesn't count and I shouldn't, shouldn't bother and things of that nature yeah yeah i do um but I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you i'm a little different and in, in stuff like that because i don't like talking to people or forcing people to do things they don't want to do um i believe in raising awareness and i believe in educating people and then after that it's on you you know um you know you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink so my whole thought process is okay i can give you these facts i can give you you know what could, what can happen or what could not happen. Now it's up to you to make your own decision. Um, I know a lot of people growing up in the black community, we do believe that our vote doesn't matter. And we don't, there's a lot of black people I know who do not vote or care to vote. And there's also a lot of black people I know who cannot vote because they are convicted felons and you know, a lot of different reasons. But um, my job, like I said, is to, like you said, is to raise the awareness, give facts, educate you. And then it's up to you. It's up to you whether you want to vote. It's up to you whether you think your vote counts. Um, and, and, and that's kind of, you know, my whole thought process. And I just don't like making people do what they, what they don't want to do, if that makes sense.